Okay. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be joined by the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health, Christine Elliott, as well as Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. David Williams. Now, to support our collective fight against COVID-19 and on the best advice made to us from medical experts, Ontario is postponing March break until the week of April 12th. This decision was made on that advice from public health officials, including the province's Chief Medical Officer of Health and many local medical officers of health as well. At this time, it is critical that we continue to prioritize the health and safety of students, staff and their families so that we can continue with the safe return to in-person learning. Postponing March break, not cancelling it, is an important way that schools can help to limit community transmission. We recognize that congregation is a key driver of the spread of COVID-19, something we realized over the winter break, and we will not take that risk again with your child, with our staff, with Ontario families. The decision is all more important as we move to protect our communities from the emerging variants of this disease. I recognize that this is one more change in a year that has been challenging for so many students and our education staff who continue to work so hard. But it is one made on the best advice of public health officials to keep them safe and to keep our schools open in this province. It is of the utmost importance that we do not travel at this time, especially as we lead into the uh, month of March. This postponement also limits any further disruption to students as they could return to in-person learning during a time that has been challenging. Uh, as Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health has said, our schools have remained safe for kids, and this move is intended to keep them that way. We have been able to successfully reopen schools and protect them from COVID-19 because we have listened to experts and added additional layers of protection with new safety measures. These measures include mandatory masking from students in grade one to three and a better quality mask for Ontario students. Province-wide access to asymptomatic testing for students and staff, as well as enhanced screening for students and staff before they enter the school, along with very clear guidelines prohibiting a congregation before and after school for students and for staff. The decision to postpone March break has not been an easy one, but necessary to keep Ontario families safe from this variant. Nothing matters more than the health and safety of Ontario students, and we will continue to act in their best interest and follow the best expert advice to protect our kids and our province. Thank you. We'll go to the phone lines for questions. Just a reminder, it's one question and one follow-up. First question. From Laura Stone at the Globe and Mail. Oh, hi there. Um, my questions are actually for Minister Elliott um, this afternoon. Minister, I was hoping you could comment on the mistake that your government made in uh, declaring this morning that you had vaccinated all of the long-term care residents uh, when in fact you had not. How is it possible that you made that mistake? And also, how is it possible that Ontario has not uh, vaccinated most of the 70,000 residents, at least with one dose, when you've issued 400,000 doses in this province? Well, there was a miscommunication internally, and that's what caused the uh, the announcement to be made. When there are still a few uh, long-term care homes that still need uh, their residents to be immunized at least with the first dose, we are working on that. And there are over 34,000 residents of long-term care homes now that have received not just the first dose but the second dose as well. And we are working to uh, make sure that every single long-term care resident and high-risk retirement home resident receives their doses uh, in the earliest possible time. To some extent, that's going to be dependent upon the vaccine supply, uh, but we are moving forward with that and hope to have it completed within very short order. Follow-up? And to follow-up, can you clarify um, who the province is going to prioritize next in the vaccine rollout? Uh, will it be done solely based on age, or are you going to... Um, kind of have a, a variety of, of groups, including essential workers and older people as part of the second phase. How are you going to communicate that and who is going to be next in line? 
Well, we are working on, on several different lines with respect to the vaccine rollout. We want to, of course, to finish in the long-term care homes with the uh, residents there. We also want to make sure that the high-risk retirement homes are dealt with and any other places of congregate living. So that may be areas where there may be adults with physical or intellectual challenges. We want to make sure that they receive the vaccine as well, uh, as well as the operations that we're carrying out in the north, making sure that we can immunize uh, residents of elder home care visits, as well as some of the um, fly-in communities right now because we want to make sure that they are also going to be immunized. And then we are going to be working on ages, uh, starting with people who are over 80 years and older. There are 600,000 people that fall into that category. So that is going to be our priority for the next while. Again, um, our ease of doing that and the ability of time it will take will, of course, be dependent on vaccine supply. We are able to vaccinate many more people now than we have in supply. So as the supplies ramp up, we will be able to ramp up our efforts as well. Next question. From Chris Rushaway at the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I was just wondering if you consulted or heard from any teachers or unions or school boards on this change given that they've urged you not to make any changes. And I'm just wondering if there would be any roadblocks to require any legislative or regulation changes as well. We have consulted um, all the uh, teacher unions, the trustee associations, and the principal councils in English and French, public and Catholic, out of the decision. Uh, we recognize uh, and appreciate their input. Um, obviously, the decision point made uh, is made uh, with one aim, which is to protect their staff and protect our students. That's why we are following the advice of the medical community and the Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, to delay uh, March break, still preserving it in the calendar year, uh, roughly one month later, but really ensuring that we don't take any risks with uh, our families and with one aim to keep these schools open because we know that they have been closed for some time due to that high spike in community transmission over the fall, over the winter break rather. And we'd rather not repeat that. We want to make sure that when we get these kids back, especially, you know, on Tuesday for the final three big boards, Toronto, Peel, York, that they stay open. That's the critical imperative. We know that, that for the mental health and development of a child, they've got to be in school. So this action is following the best medical advice. Uh, we continue to listen to the voices of all stakeholders in the education space, appreciating the hard work of our frontline staff. Uh, but then the day, it's about keeping them safe, the very members that they advocate for and all families in this province. And that's exactly what we'll continue to do during the pandemic. Follow up? Yes, the other thing I wanted to ask was about um, if this date change is going to be extended to private schools as well, and if not, um, why not? Well, the Ministry of Education um, has authority over public schools in the province of Ontario, but the message today to both public and private schools in this province is that they should defer the March break. In public education, public schools, we're responsible for, we have that authority. The strong sig message we're sig signaling to private schools in Ontario is that they should do the same. Uh, we cannot take these risks for all students in the province, uh, and so we are uh, very much expecting cooperation with us uh, within the province of Ontario to reduce the potential for congregation, to reduce the potential risk that comes with these variants because they are, are in our province, uh, in part because of uh, you know the, the challenges we're facing at the border and the porous nature of it. It's in Ontario and now we have to remain vigilant. The Minister of Health and Deputy Premier has been very clear. This is not a return to normal and so we're asking everyone in the education space to work with us uh, collaborate in the interest of public health so that we can get back to some normal and uh, keep our kids safe both in public and private schools in Ontario. Next question. From Graham Richardson at CTV Ottawa. Please go ahead. Hi Minister. Uh, what is this being driven by? Um, is this uh, fear of travel or is this lost education time in the class you're trying to make, make up? Could you, uh, could you tell me which one is weighting your decision more? Well, I'll turn it to the Chief Medical Officer of Health, but obviously we're governed by uh, advice from the medical community to limit the potential for transmission and really limit or try to prevent um, a scenario we saw over the holidays where there just was a massive spike of transmission uh, and positivity of our, of our kids, of our young, youngest learners. Uh, there are pedagogical reasons, obviously. We want to create consistency for children. That's important, to your point about learning quality. 
But what's driving this really is public health imperatives to protect our province, to not repeat what we saw over the holidays, and to make sure that we can keep schools open, which I think if there's one consensus, we, we all believe in that. We all want to do that. Uh, we ought not take any risks. But I will turn it over to Dr. Williams for further context. <clears throat> So from the, the health standpoint, we did consult with our public health measures table and there's a number of things that are moving at the same time. So we have want to be cautious. We want everybody back in school. That's been one of our initiatives and hopefully by uh, we're planning by Tuesday, we'll have uh, the students in class back again throughout the province. And as Mr. Lecce has alluded to, we want to get them in the school and keep in there and keep it safe. We have at the same time, and you're back in the studio in a few more minutes, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Brown will be updating us on the modeling because the new thing that's added to us since um, the end of the year and now in January is the variance of concern. And we'll show you how, why that timing is impeccably important when we're looking at uh, March break. Of course, when we are doing some other initiatives as uh, the minister and, and the premier have announced, uh, we'll be looking at uh, the framework and how that's going to affect. But that doesn't mean everything's open, everybody does what they want to do. We still have to have emphasizing stay at home. That means we are not encouraging travel during the, if it was the March break, we wouldn't encourage that. We don't want a lot of intra-provincial travel either, as well as inter and international, uh, definitely at this time with the very much rising rapid issue of variants of concern. And so we're very concerned about that, as well as um, our vaccine program. As the minister is alluding to, we've had a pause in it while we're waiting for supplies to arrive, and we want that more robust and carrying forward to give us a bit more time. So the number of factors that are very critical um, for not only that I'm concerned about, but medical officers officers in the province of Ontario are concerned about as we uh, deal with these different issues at this time. So uh, the recommendation from the committee was to delay. Um, the specific week was not precise, but this was chosen with uh, proper consultation. And so we are uh, knowing that people do need a break on that uh, level there, but we want a safe break, a careful break, and one is at the right time and the right way to make sure, as the ministers allude to, that we keep our schools safe, keep our transmission rates and our children down, and we keep monitoring it very carefully. Follow up? For Minister Lecce, um, your government uh, was very loud and uh, very consistent in demanding more random uh, fast, rapid test kits from the federal government. In my city, there have only been a few hundred random tests done in a couple of schools. Why aren't you doing more asymptomatic testing? Why are test kits sitting in a warehouse not being used? I don't understand this. Yeah, I'll turn it over to Dr. Williams province-wide perspective but within our schools and the capacity we have leveraged in the Ministry of Education for our schools now that we reopen in 2021 and as we reopen the final three big boards Toronto York and Peel on Tuesday let me assure you we have capacity for upwards of 50,000 tests every week a blend of PCR and the antigen rapid tests we've worked with public health officers I've been on the phone with medical officers of health for about the past two weeks to ensure that that capacity exists when these kids go back to ensure that they are present within our schools wherever there are risks uh, and to make sure that there's speed associated with the result hence the rapid nature of the test so we are using every single um, you know uh, all capacity available to us to make sure kids are safe that's a, a big change we introduced in 2021 we had it in the four highest risk pro uh, regions of public health units uh, that asymptomatic testing we're now expanding it province-wide the result of that testing when we did it in the fall the late fall was that we had a very low rate of asymptomatic spread, 1.8% for students, roughly 1% for staff, notwithstanding the parents tested were at 4.5, demonstrating again, which is relevant for today's decision, that being in school was the safest place within that community. But in the context of the broader application utilization of rapid tests, I'll turn it back to Dr. Williams. <clears throat> so if I understand when you said in our in my area, you're talking about Ottawa, if I'm correct, in particular, um, that uh, we've had consultations with the medical officer of health and team there, and they do have uh, some of the rapid tests to use. 
They also feel that they want to utilize any test they need to do to carry out the uh, symptomatic uh, cases, contacts and family members and they're undergoing a number of uh, excellent programs and services. They did some before Christmas, they're doing them afterwards. I've asked them if they're going to use rapid tests exclusively. They said no, they have an arrangement with a lab. They can get quick turnaround. The key thing we want is that people get tested. The turnaround time is not delayed. So it's prompt testing, prompt turnaround. And then if you have positive cases, they're followed up quickly with uh, make sure if it isn't a PCR, it is a PCR. Uh, and that PCR is submitted for our 501 mutation screening. So there's different areas we're using in. Uh, I know the, the Deputy Premier and Minister Elliott may want to comment on the wider use of the rapid testing one. We know we're this week and coming up, we're rolling it out uh, in the province for long-term care. And that's going to result in a lot of tests being used. We're already using different ones around the province. So it's ramping up because when you're going to run a program, hand out kits, you want to run a program, one that you know is going to be run consistently, properly, documented and, and uh, recorded. So you just can't throw the kits out and do it. You have to set up all the infrastructure. So that's being put in place right now and to make sure we have the capacity. The key thing is that when we're doing it in our programs and with their health units, the testing, if you're going to uh, require parents to take part, we don't want the frustration we had in the fall where people took a long time in lineups, long time to get appointments and a long turnaround time. We want that expedited in whatever way. If we can use our regular systems, that's fine. If we have to use rapid tests, we'll do that as well or combinations therein. The main thing is that we want to make sure our monitoring and surveillance is proper, critical and timely. Next question. From Randy Rath at CHCH TV, please go ahead. Hi, um, I, I want to ask about vaccines again. Um, the, it seems that the AstraZeneca vaccine isn't as effective against some of the new mutations of the virus. Um, are you confident? I, I guess this is for Dr. Williams or or the health minister. Are you confident that um, the the AstraZeneca vaccine is, 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 is going to work, is something that we should be injecting into people. And are you going to prioritize giving the more effective vaccines to the most vulnerable in our society? Well, right now we know that the AstraZeneca vaccine is going through the final stages for approval with Health Canada, and hopefully it will be released very soon. So we will have three uh, vaccines that we'll be able to use in Ontario, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and then the AstraZeneca. But as far as its effectiveness vis-a-vis uh, -vis the different um, variants of concern, I would have to turn that over to Dr. Williams. <clears throat> So um, it's an excellent question and you can imagine with two things moving quickly, approval of a new product and what it is and our uh, advisory, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, combined with other, other international bodies that are undertaking uh, assessment of the vaccine, its efficacy, different age groups, different categories, and against the new evolving situation of the variants. And as you can imagine, there's not a, a lot of uh, some of the clinical trials we're not addressing that. They're looking at that assertively right now. So far, we've been appraised that it does have um, effectiveness against all three strains, but there is some concern, especially with the South African strain and some of the information we're trying to obtain from that area and ones who have used it to see what is that, how effective is it, what are the limitations. Still much to be worked on that. At the moment, of course, we don't have, uh, we only have the one uh, strain, but we'll look for the one South African isolated thus far, and we'll keep monitoring that situation. So the science is moving quickly, the advice is being obtained as quickly as possible, and as the Minister Ali has just alluded to, um, the uh, approval of it is still pending, and we're waiting for that any day now, and that includes uh, what stipulations and aspects may be around that approval, and will be advised by those expert bodies if and when that is available. Follow up? Thank you, Minister Elliott. Um, are people moving forward when we start to give more vaccinations and it becomes um, routine, I suppose that you could say, um, are people going to be able to choose which vaccine they want? Um, or are they going to be told, you know, this is what's available, this is what you get, and if you don't like it, that's too bad? 
Well, that's what the situation is for now because we only have two types and we know there are certain limitations with respect to the Pfizer vaccine because of the cold storage requirements and so on. Uh, but uh, we're still far away from being in a place where we'll have enough vaccines that we'll be able to carry them all and people will be able to choose. So I don't want to be speculative about that. What's important right now is that we do get an effective vaccine into the arms of anyone in Ontario who wants to re receive the vaccine. Next question, and this will be the final question. From Travis Danraj at Global News, please go ahead. Hi, Minister, thank you for taking my question. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, Queen's Park MPPs are returning to the legislature next week, and then they have a scheduled break uh, on the week of the 15th. Is that break going to be canceled as well? As we have seen, you know, some ministers uh, have had problems following public health guidelines and staying put in the province? Uh, the Ontario legislature is one of the few legislatures in the country that has sat throughout this pandemic in, uh, in person. We sat through the summer uh, and took action systematically throughout it to act in the public interest. Um, you know, quite frankly, uh, our commitment is to serve the people and take action to protect human health. Uh, right now, as you know, the federal government is not sitting in person. We are, and we have, and will continue to. In fact, we are returning in person on Tuesday. But as we're here present today, and as we have been every day, our work continues uh, to protect human lives. Um, so we'll continue to follow public health advice, and we'll continue to ask all Ontarians to do the same, because if we do so, if we take this seriously, we follow public health advice, we will not compromise the ability to keep our schools open, which I believe is something we could all agree on. Uh, and it's also a secondary point to discourage March break. We want Canadians to stay in their communities in this province, not take the risk given the uh, obvious uh, challenge of these new variants imposing difficulty within our communities and on our health care system. Next follow-up, this will be the final question. Well, and this actually is from a colleague of mine, Sophia Mulligan, because I guess she's not going to have a chance to ask a question today, but it is a question I have as well. Uh, 93 schools have cases and the hot zones have not even opened yet. Uh, how can you assure parents with that stat that schools reopening are really going to be safer? Uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Williams for his medical perspective, but what I can assure parents is in the fall, at a peak of community transmission, sometimes hitting uh, daily rates well above the current rates today, we demonstrate to parents that the program, the protocols, and every uh, infection prevention measure we put into, into place has ably able to keep a child in school safely. In fact, in the highest risk communities and postal codes of this province where we did asymptomatic testing in those hotspots, we saw low levels of transmission. According to the Chief Medical Officer of Health, well over 90% of the cases in our schools were not transmitted in school. They were brought from the community, which underscores the original point. We've got to keep these community numbers down. It's why we waited to get kids back, the only province to do so, out of abundance of caution, not to put at risk your child and your family, and obviously the schools that we want to keep open in the province. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Williams for additional context. So I think when you refer to the 93, I'd have to ask in what time frame you're talking about. Um, the number I have for today is not that number, and I don't have in front of me to give you an exact quote. Um, the fact is that those are cases where often in the pre-screening tool, uh, the parents have some concerns and they are tested and assessed, and uh, we're finding a certain number that are positive before coming to school. Uh, unfortunately, they've picked it up in the community, and so that's the strength of the system to identify these ones. Why they are students, they are not in the school yet, and that's where we're asking parents if you have any concerns at all, any issues that are related to maybe potential contact or exposure in that, and you feel you want to have your child assessed, we want to make sure that that's available, because we'd rather have that done and rule it out quickly rather than the child come to the school in there. But our so far, our surveillance system, our screening is working well. Well, parents are taking it very seriously and responsibly and uh, others as well so we want that to continue to show up so if we identified 93 and already since we've opened up in January I think that's a positive sign that the screening tool is being done and that the uh, parents and family members are taking it seriously at this time thanks everyone